Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Comic Source Comic Boom collaboration. Time to talk about the cull. That's right. Rack and I are here uh, doing something other than a DC Spotlight for once. This is a book I've been promoting, been talking about for a long time. It's finally here, released uh, Wednesday, the, was it the 16th, I guess? August 16th, uh, 2023. Yes. Uh, both digitally and on Kelly Thompson Substack and in comic shops. If you haven't heard and you didn't get yourself a copy, uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to find one. It's sold out. It's going to a second printing. You know, I talked to Kelly about this a few weeks ago, and the pre-order numbers weren't necessarily what they expected. I mean, so many independent comics, the pre-order numbers have been fantastic lately, whether it's Tynan, whether it's Stephanie Phillips on Grimm. People are paying attention. For whatever reason, people didn't pay attention. Retailers didn't hear a lot of buzz. They didn't hear a lot of things ahead of time. I think pre-order numbers on this weren't what they probably should have been. And the reason I say that, first of all, again, it's going to a second printing. They're already sold out on the distributor level. There's no more books. And, and what that means is if you're not familiar with the way the industry works, usually the distributor will you know, order a certain number of copies from the printer. The printer prints them, ships them to the distributor's warehouse. And the distributor distributor then disseminates them out to the comic shops in the numbers that they ordered with a amount in reserve at the distribution warehouse. There is no reserve, right? In between the time the distributors ordered the comics from the printer, the publisher actually ordered the comics from the printer with the initial print run numbers and then got them to the distribution warehouse. In between that time, comic shops ordered more. Hey, I need more up in the order, up in the order, up in the order. So basically what that means is the day before this went on sale in comic shops, the distributor had already all the extra that had been printed and was supposed to be there at the warehouse for future orders. It all got eaten up. There's no more. So what that tells me is that retailers didn't order enough either because again, they didn't feel like there'd be a demand or readers didn't tell the retailers to order one found out about it after the pre the, pre-order final order cutoff right and so you can't find it now it's already sold out everywhere now the second printing thank god is going to be there in comic shops on the same day as issue two so if you missed out on issue one you weren't able to get one uh you can pick it up obviously you can read it digitally you can subscribe to kelly thompson substack and check it out that way uh for what that means as far as um investment wise speculator wise what have you first printings yeah they're going to be worth a little bit more especially the one in 50 Tula Lote variant, which if you're watching us on YouTube, it's the one with the sad faces like spray painted on it. The main cover by yeah. Matea de, de Luis is fantastic as well. Uh, much more in style with what's inside the book as opposed to yeah. Tula Lote's, which is a little, um, it's it, the lines aren't quite as clean. Um, it's more in her it's, style. You know, it's a softer style. Th- this is a gorgeous comic book. Absolutely gorgeous comic book. It, it, it's absolutely eye popping. And, and I got to give a shout out to you. And, uh, you know, y- y- you talk about this being under ordered. It's a cumulative effect. Uh, this thing is exponential because you mentioned this to me. And this was, I don't know if that was a month or two months ago. I mentioned it to my retailer because I'm a longtime collector. I'm one of the probably the bigger collectors at the shop. Uh, he, if I if I tell my retailer about something, he orders extra shelf copies. And so ironically enough, we have like shelf copies at my comic shop. He sold out. And uh, it's, you know, it, it just goes to show you guys, talk about comic books, you know, look at previews. Uh, I, I know that this, there's a second printing of The Call coming out because I, I always look at previews. It's hooked up to my comic shop. It's the fastest way and the quickest way to order comics or at least know what's going on. And... Thank God, because you know what I, I read. I love uh, Kelly Thompson's *The Black Cloaks*. Pretty good. I've, I've been enjoying that, but I gotta admit, this call here, I've I, I read her. I read Kelly Thompson's Substack, but I'm not subscribed. But I read. I do get the uh, that the the newsletter, and wow, I this this one really impressed me. It really impressed me, and I'm I'm glad we're gonna be talking about it. Yeah, and I hope everybody, I hope you guys all got a chance to go and check out the article that I wrote a few weeks ago. I went in depth, step by step. You know, each of the announcements that they made, each of the little preview images, Kelly talking about it, talking about the different characters and what have you. Um, I, I was trying to get the word out, but, you know, again, uh, that just wasn't ordered in, in the numbers that it probably should have been. So, yeah, uh, if you didn't get a copy, pro- I'm sure you can find one on eBay, but you're not going to be able to get it for, for cover price, especially that one in 50. Um, 
So I, I ordered myself, I got ordered a, a copy of issue one, plus a whole set with all the covers, including the one in 50. Plus, I think I picked up like one extra of the main cover. So I, I, I'm covered. I knew this was wow. going to be big. Um, and yeah, once, you know, once in a while it, it pays, it pays off. I mean, again, I, you know, I say that, okay, maybe I could sell some of these for money. Oftentimes a, a book is going to have to continue to be fantastic. Something like saga continue to have legs in order to have long-term value, or it's got to do something like walking dead where it goes into other media, which this completely could. Uh, we know this is a five issue series, but I, I think I saw, Kelly and Matias say that they have plans for more if the demand is there. Well, based on the first issue, um, yeah, it seems like demand is uh, is going to be there. So, uh, yeah, you want to give in your mind, Rocky, what you feel like the premise of the of this story is. Uh, yeah, well, th there's you know, it's in my mind the premise of this story, and I, and I really didn't have much idea going in, but I I read this and. And I have to say, it was an absolute pleasure rereading this two or three times because, um, well, let me just give the premise. This is about a group of friends that are getting together on an early morning to ostensibly uh, just do some filming. Uh, it's almost like they wanted to make an amateur movie of some kind, and they want they get up in the wee hours of the morning to go to, near the beach, and there's some rock islands off their beach, and they want to. It's a low tide, and they want to go, and they they want to do some filming then that's what it sounds like but apparently one of the one of the group this Cleo has an alternative agenda uh, and a, an alternative motive for for going out and and that forms the basis and the surprise of why they're really going out there and this and and the cliffhanger that results is really is what grabs the reader and while they're making that journey out there you get all these incredible character revelations and just and what you don't get in dialogue, you get in the fantastic art of a Mattia Del. I'm going to mispronounce that name. Uh, you're going to help me out, J uh, Jace. Mattia Del uh, Elias? Elio? Uh, I, <laughs> I, so I looked around online to try to find interviews with him, with him <laughs> saying his name. Uh, yeah. And the only interviews I could find with him were in other languages. Yeah. One in Spanish, one in Italian, which makes it very hard to, you know, am I saying it right? Am I not? I, I think it's D. Ooh, Elis? Elis? Matia D. Elias? I U L I S. Yeah, I know it's I U L I S. You know, D E space I U L I S. Yeah, and I always, I mean, I really wanted to know how exactly do I say this? And I'm just not, yeah, I'm just not sure. So apologies, Matia, for butchering your name. I think it's D. Eulis. Eulis. Yeah, I think. It's. Yeah, I, I should say I should say that I know that in Kelly Thompson, in the way she described it, and from what I read, she's out. She said this was sort of like a an, a cross between Goonies meets you know it has the 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 tone and the sort of the the visceral sort of horror feel of something is killing the children combined with Goonies. And I don't know if I totally agree with her on that on this first issue, but I don't have to agree. It's still fantastic, and uh, and again for all the reasons that we're going to be talking about here. So, what about you? What's uh, how would you describe uh, how would you describe uh, this first issue for you? Yeah, it's so interesting, right? Adventure, yes, adventure, yes, kids. So yes, Goonies. Something is killing children, maybe less so. There is a horror aspect, but we don't get much of that here. I wouldn't say we get much horror at all. It's more suspense. It's more yeah. building, as you said. Um, but I mean, you have to give people touchstones. You have to, you know, hey, this is something familiar. A lot of people know Goonies. A lot of people know something is killing children. So that's merely a starting point. It's really tangential in terms of, of the reference. Um, but what is so interesting, you know, it is hinted at in the solicits, or some of the interviews and information that Kelly gave out before the series came out, and Rocky alluded to it, that, yeah, one of this group is lying. They're not telling the truth. Rocky Kelm comes right out and says it's Cleo. That's my suspicion as well, and we'll get into why that is and why she appears to have, or what I'm assuming is appears to have, um, tricked her friends into, under the premise of making a short film, coming out to this rock. Yeah. The other thing is the rock itself, right? That is an, also a reference to Goonies. Um, it's a rock that's off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, Pacific Ocean, it's right off the beach. Um, here, I think this is set on the East Coast, if I'm not mistaken, but it's that same idea, that same big black rock out in the ocean, very much a landmark. Again, it was in Goonies. That's one of the tie-ins tendentially as well. 
and that rock being there being kind of symbolic of joining these two worlds because this is a extra dimensional story if you will um and we see that when we see so, some of the images we've seen show will look to be like these giant kaiju and one of them uh is the the image of the giant kaiju which we saw as a preview image months and months ago yeah that one there if you're watching us on youtube that's the cover for issue uh, for the second printing of issue one so yeah what does that mean well it's a flash forward which has been used a lot in in comics and other media and it's sort of a cheat a lot of people have, have filmmakers and storytellers have in a way used it as a crutch um it was sort of novel when it was first done get that first image that first event that first whatever and then go back and tell the story of how we got here right yeah. um I, I won't say it's lazy storytelling but it's it is sort of a a your backward engineering things like give them the hook first and then back up and hey and, let's find out how we got here and let me uh, i just i just to interject the reason why i thought it was such a great hook is that and it's a credit to the to the Matias fantastic art is you 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 see you know that's going to happen at some point later on in the story but if you look at that picture and that's on that opening page you see all these running shoes the people the their their shoes are still on the beach but where are the people and you see one person with their hands on the ground almost hiding inside one of this strange alien looking plants it's the oddest the thing, thing is eating them I yeah think it's eating them. Or, or maybe it is eating them i don't know but they, <laughs> i never even thought of that <laughs> it's probably be, this humans being eaten i don't know yeah. but <laughs> yeah apparently they don't like to eat the shoes the shoes are left by and there's other clothes oh. as well mostly, you know mostly shoes i never thought uh, of that <laughs> yeah or sandals and what have you uh so yeah it's Again, it's it's an image that sticks with you. It's visceral, and then you're like, "What? You know, what exactly is going on?" Yeah. Um, and then we're going to go back and tell you how how we got here. So, uh, again, I think a lot of storytellers use it as a crutch. Um, hey, you know, stick with us. This because you're going to get to see this how this happened. That I wouldn't say it's a crutch or it's lazy storytelling here because it's done. First of all, we get so little, right? So little context. We're not even sure. Like, you know, I mentioned I mentioned it looked like to me he's being eaten. Maybe not. Uh, um, but yeah, we have no idea how, and, how we got here. And, and I need to interject little. again, not only is maybe somebody being eaten, but somebody's recording this it's through a camera and you can see the, the battery symbol on the camera. The image itself is through a lens is somebody is filming this. So at least there's one survivor filming this horrific event. So it's interesting. Who's, who's the person holding the camera? Who's the person being eaten? Who do the running shoes belong to? I mean, right away, right in, we're, we're we got all these questions before the story even begins. And so what, what yeah, it's a great way to start yeah. a comic off. It, it is. And, and to be fair, that, so that's not even the first page, right? The first page is before <laughs> that, that page says now, you know, yeah, people being named, whatever. So we get the before and we're talking about Blackwater beach, you know, named for this big uh, rock that apparently casts shadows on the water, thus black water, what have you. And we see any number of beachgoers, typical beach scene. We see the sun, we see a lot of birds flying around, um, and that's kind of the, the first page. And then we get into that double page now where this, you know, monsters and what have you, whatever's going on there. But what I find to be interesting, as we go back and look at this again, having read it and, and knowing what we know now, this rock being some sort of portal, uh, some link between the two dimensions or two worlds or two universes or however you want to put it, right? The rock doesn't care, right? The rock doesn't care. The rock exists, the rock's there. The rock's there in our world. The rock's there in their world. The rock is uncaring, unfeeling. It just is there. And it's this link between the two worlds that it's like the anchor. You know, it's like the touch point. It's like the reference point. If you could, you know, the expression, if walls could talk, if this rock could talk, what could this rock say? The rock is there. The rock has seen any number of beachgoers over the centuries that this town has existed. People have come to the beach, families, sun fun what have you the rock is also witness to this horrific event where these people are being eaten on the beach that's so interesting to me that the story starts off not with the monsters not with the characters uh the, these teenage characters that we learn a lot about with very little dialogue as uh, rocky mentioned but we start with the rock there i think there's something there's something to that the rock is i think it's a symbol of something larger than just the fact that it exists in both worlds. I found it really interesting 
that Kelly started off talking about this rock. Um, yeah, again, and it I was wasn't something that I, I thought about when I read it the first time, but knowing what you know by the time you get to the end, you go back and do a reread. I think there's a lot more there. Well, not only that, uh, at, near the end, when the, this rock is clearly a uh, sort of a link of a trans, uh, of sort of a link to another place, this other place, you see that there's ex the exact duplicate of that same rock is is littered in this alien ocean. So there's more. Th this rock seems to be identical to other rocks. So I'm guessing this might be transports to other worlds, uh, a portal between Earth. Maybe there's other worlds that are being transported to this other place as well. If you look there, when you get in the by by the time you get to the end and you realize this this rock might be a portal to someplace else, it it you it's really sort of fantastic. And it's like, wow, this, what started off as such a personal story where you get to know all these characters, which we haven't even talked about yet. We're just, we're still talking about the, the second page. We're talking about a rock sale and we haven't even got into the meat and potatoes, the characters yet. Uh, just, uh, just really good. This is really good. And uh, my God, I mean, we've been talking for like uh, 16 minutes already. We haven't even, we've only mentioned one of the characters and like, this is, uh, this is definitely a, uh, Thank God for indie comics. This puts a smile on my face because DC Comics doesn't always do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 100%. So much value, rereadability in this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we get the rock, we get the, the flash forward, and then we we get the flashback. Okay, 12 hours ago, how did we get to this point? Rocky mentioned Cleo. Um, she's the first character that we meet. And what's so interesting, so first of all, I'll call out Matias' gorgeous art, as we mentioned, uh, very much a photorealistic style. The other thing that he does Oftentimes it's four, sometimes three, sometimes five, but widescreen panels, they go all the way across the page, horizontally one stacked on top of another. So it gives it a very cinematic, you know, that um, term gets thrown around a lot, but very much kind of a movie screen feel, right? Um, and again, there's very little dialogue, but you can learn so much about these characters just by looking, you gotta pay attention. You gotta look at the details, right? 12 hours ago, so she's making these flags. She's putting them in her backpack. That's a hint right there. She knows that they're going to go somewhere where they're going to need to leave a trail to find their way back, right? And they think it's maybe just the rock. She she perhaps has suspicions. She perhaps knows better. You also see a picture of her and her brother on the desk. Smiles on their faces. You also notice on her arm, there are scars from cutting. So she's someone who cuts herself. So there's some, maybe some uh, mental illness there, some sort of trauma, what have you. Also notice she has black fingernail polish, but it's, it's chipped. It's chipped. It's not done well. Uh, so it's either something that she hasn't been able to maintain, something she hasn't made the time for, something else has happened in her life. It's caused an, an issue. Uh, and then as you get a look at her room, we see it's 334 from the clock on her desk. We see her with all these uh, flags packed in her backpack. We see her putting on her hoodie and she looks a little worn, you know, as she turns and looks in her mirror, her mirror has uh, pictures of her and her brother on it. And there's, even though she, you can tell that she's young, there's a weariness to her face. Uh, and then as she sneaks out of the house, uh, she walks by her parents' bedroom. Her father's there. Notice he has his glasses on as he fell asleep in bed, the lights on clearly he didn't mean to fall asleep. So what's going on? You know, there's something going on in the lives of these people that has them unsettled. Uh, her mother is asleep at the kitchen table um, on top of these missing notifications, these missing posters for her brother, Jake, who's missing. Um, and th again, there's an unsettledness to it. Clearly it's because her brother's missing. That could explain the cutting. It explains the weariness. It explains the overall exhaustion that you feel in this household. Uh, Clearly, this has taken over these people's lives, and it's traumatic, and it's sad, and maybe Cleo would get the impression, maybe she's somebody who's who's not just going to hang up missing posters um, or, or stay inside. She's going to go out there and try to do something to find her brother. Yeah. Um, but clearly, this has taken over their lives. You see a bunch of laundry on the couch that seems to be neglected. You see stacks and stacks of pizza boxes in the kitchen indicating they haven't had time for, you know, family meals or cook or what have you. Everything is focused. Everything is consumed by the loss of, uh, of Jake. So again, and there I, I'm talking about all this, right? All this stuff, all this context, all this storytelling, there are no words 
on those three pages other than the words on the missing poster. There are no words. That is all from Matias art at what, you know, whatever direction that Kelly's providing to provide context into the character of Cleo in terms of where she is now, where is she now in her life? So, you know, and again, they're not necessarily things you notice. I didn't notice the, the scars on Cleo's arm the first time. Yeah, um, that I, I didn't when either. I went back through it, yeah. I was like, oh, huh. That shows a lot. So, yeah. And, uh, and what's, what's, what I, what I like about the fact that there's no dialogue is that you, first of all, it pulls you in. It, this is something that can really only effectively be, d- be done in the comic book medium because every single panel is intentional and deliberate. And what I love about it is that I want to take my time because I know I'm afraid of missing something because I know it's not going to be in the dialogue because Kelly Thompson is not going to spoon feed the reader. She's allowing her artist, she's allowing uh, Matito or Ilius to, to work his magic. And boy, does he do it. Uh, even the last name of Cleo, his, it's Washington. It's on the, it's on the poster. They don't, you don't tell that you, you got to figure that you got to, you got to look at the panels. You got to look at the images. You can imagine what this family has gone through and you've learned so much and good Lord, you're on, you're, you're only on page four or five. And I'm telling you, this is how so many people who, you, you, there's an art to reading comic books a little bit. If you've never read a comic before, and these this could be a comic, if you don't take your time looking at the at these images, and you're just reading the pages with the dialogue, you'll get through this comic in three minutes, and you'll completely miss the point, and you'll miss the, the experience. And I can't emphasize enough how impressed I was, the how kudos to Kelly Thompson for collaborating with this artist so well. And I understand that her and Matteo de Ilias, they, they, they work together on two Jessica Jones series. So they've collaborated with each other before. And boy, can you tell because it sure shows here. Yeah, you, she knows enough to get, get out of the way. You don't have dialogue. Uh, and again, the, we'll, we'll talk about the lettering by Hassan Atman Elhau in a little while. Uh, but she, yeah, she knows enough to get out of the way. Let, let these details come through. Uh, don't clutter it up with with word balloons, you know, even, even something as simple as the last panel as she's leaving. And we get a scene where we're worms. eye view. it's called, right? Like we're all the way on the ground looking up as she walks out the front door. Um, and then on the following page, it's one of my favorite pages, if not my favorite page in the book. Uh, no, go back. It's, uh, yeah, it's that, that last page. The first time we were outside the colors that Mattia uses, particularly in the middle panel, when we're looking from behind Cleo, we're looking out. There's a sense that she's about to go on this grand adventure. And because of the view, because we're kind of looking from behind her, we're on the same path, right? We're about to go on this adventure as well. The town opens up in front of her. It's dark. The, um, the lighting work that Mattia does is fantastic with the street lights and the mist uh, and the cool blues, again, ev- evoking a real mood and then her phone pings and, you know, she starts to uh, talk to her friends, but it just, it's fantastic work and it's fantastic subtext. And there are things that you pick up unconsciously. Again, like Rocky said, you can't speed through this and just flip through because there's no words. It's just, okay, I'm just looking for the words to read. This isn't a novel, right? It's a comic. The storytelling is in the pictures. The other thing that I want to do as we're going through and reviewing this is, in Kelly Thompson's Substack, she did give some character descriptions that maybe will provide a little more context to these characters. Uh, so we know this person is Cleo Washington. Cleo was ambitious and charming, everyone's favorite, and then Jake went missing and the bottom fell out of everything, including Chloe. Her relationship, one of the strongest things in her life, crumbled under the pressure, and now that and now what's left is unclear. Her favorite color is blue. Her favorite food is sandwiches if it's cold and ramen if it's hot. And her favorite movie is Alien. So again, little detail, little context that provides some uh, more information about uh, the character. What this relationship is that crumbled, that was one of the strongest things in her life, we'll learn about uh, a little bit later. So yeah, again, just absolutely fantastic storytelling. Uh, and then from there, we jump to, um, to the next character. And in strong contrast, uh, so this next character, first of all, let me say, Her name is Katie. Uh, She's an African-American young lady. Uh, And in stark contrast to the quietness of and sort of the sadness that permeates Cleo's house, that is not the way at all it is at Katie's. It's brightly lit. Her father's there, even though it's 3.30 in the morning. 
Uh, they're both awake. They're both talking. There's a comfortable exchange between the two. Again, there are things hinted at. Her father's sleeping on the couch rather than in Aiden's room, whoever Aiden is. Um, and there's some intimations like, well, if you if you go and sleep in Aiden's room, it's admitting it's real, right? That's whatever's real. So again, I'm trying to read through the lines. I, it seems to me that perhaps if he chooses, instead of sleeping on the couch, to go sleep in Aiden's room, I'm, I'm taking that to be Katie's brother, perhaps? Yeah, that's what I thought or, it was, a brother, yeah. Or, yeah, or maybe it's her father's partner, and if he goes and sleeps in that room, uh, whether it's her brother or his partner, if he goes and sleeps in there, then, then it's acknowledging that something is not the way that it should be, and, you, and there's an acceptance there, right? As opposed to sort of the transient situation of, oh, I'm just going to sleep on the couch for a few nights because Aiden's going to come back or, or if, if it's not Aiden and it's, it's uh, Katie's mother and, and her father's. Yeah. Uh, What's well, Adrian? Wife. It's actually Adrian. A Adrian, Adrian, sorry. But she says he uh, won't be home for at least. So it looks like Adrian is some, at some point going to be home. That's why I assumed it was a brother like you. So as opposed right. to. So, yeah. So if we assume that, but if he goes and sleeps in, Adrian's room, <laughs> yeah. maybe the maybe the mother is there, and maybe the mother is asleep in the bedroom of the you know of the parents. Yeah. If he so if the father goes and sleeps in Adrian's room, it's it's admitting that's the new normal, right? Like she, the wife's going to sleep in the bedroom, I'm going to be sleeping in the son's room, and that that becomes a new normal again, as as opposed to hey, it's just a little fight. I'll sleep on the couch for a few nights, then I'll be back in my marital bed or what have you. So yeah, again, we're, I'm totally speculating. We don't know exactly what's going on, but again, when we talk about subtext, there's a lot here. Katie's quick, even though there's stuff going on, family drama, relationship drama, whatever, she's quick with a smile. Her, her conversation, her dialogue, uh, the vocabulary she uses when she speaks to her father, it's not father, it's not daddy, it's dad. There's a, there's a sense of being close to being on the same level. You know, the dad's a little worried that uh, she's going out so late, but he trusts her. Again, she's quick with the smile. Um, so, again, it, it's little things and the brightness of the lights, um, the concern on Katie's face when she does mention, uh, hey, why don't you sleep in Adrian's room? Won't be home. No. Oh, because it's, then it's real. Hey, it is real, whether you want to admit it or not. Uh, so, again, there's there's context there. Not, not as much, not, not as many little clues um, visually as we got when we were introduced to Cleo, but it's because there's more dialogue here because Katie has someone to play off of. So the clues are in the dialogue, right? Who's Adrian? What's going on? Why is her father on the couch? You know, where's the mother? What's going on in, in terms of that? And then the relationship, the easiness um, the solid relationship that Katie has with her father, as opposed to nobody saying anything in the Washington household. Clearly the loss of Jake, the disappearance of Jake has put a strain on the relationship between Cleo and her mother and her father and probably her father and her mother, right? The father wasn't still at the kitchen table. The father didn't fall asleep at the kitchen table. He was in the bedroom. Um, so again, isolation here, Katie and her father are together. So uh, interesting. Anything to add to the, uh, Katie's intro there, Rocky? Uh, no, I, I, other than the fact that we know that she's, uh, she tells her father that uh, she's going to go out and they're going to be doing some, you know, she, she, I got the impression she was a director, that she's sort of a director of this film. And, and I'm at this point in the story, I'm linking that to what uh, Cleo is doing. And I'm not sure what Cleo is doing with, uh, by putting together all those little flags with the sad face on them. And, and, she, and I'm assuming that she, Cleo is probably a friend of, of, uh, of, uh, of Katie and they're basically going to go and they're going to be doing some filming or directing because she talks about going out with her friends. And so it's clearly, this is in the wee hours of the morning. And so all these friends are getting together in the wee hours of the morning to go out It's for a low tide. And so it's still more, it's just adding, it's, it's peaking the curiosity. You know, it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's like, we're slowly, it's the dots, you know, the puzzle slowly being filled in and what's funny about it is that these puzzle pieces are very, very different. And you talked about it through the tone and the mood of the different households. Clearly, there's a tragedy in one household, and yet this household is more upbeat. It's brighter. And 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 that that tone, you see differences in tone and different characters as we progress through the story. So it works very well. 
Yeah, and again, little clues, right? Like the, that page that I love, the previous page before we actually see Katie for the first time, when uh, we get a close-up on Cleo's phone, Cleo says, hey, you sure we need to meet at 3 a.m., babe? Right? So yeah. we know, again, Cleo and Katie got to be some sort of relationship. You're not just going to call your friend, babe. Got to be some romantic feelings or some sort of relationship there. And then Katie's response, yes. And, you know, you see a little picture of Katie on the phone, and then we go to Katie. So, again, a little transition um, that means everything. And as far as what we were told on Substack, Katie Carter, bit of an it girl. Katie excels at nearly everything. And before, quote, unquote, the incident, she and Cleo were one of Blackwater High's it couples, quote, unquote. Cleo, a burgeoning writer. Katie, a burgeoning director. It seemed like a match made. But as things unraveled with Cleo, Katie struggled to deal with her own unraveling. Katie's favorite color is orange. Her favorite food is milkshakes. Her favorite movie is Moonlight. Uh, and yeah, I thank you for pointing out this is where we get the, the first hint of uh, or first um, information, first context for, hey, they're going out in the middle of the night, early in the morning, whatever you want to call it, because they're going to be filming. Uh, they're going to be making a film. So um, after uh, Katie heads out, next we meet uh, the twins, the Quan twins, Wade Quan and Will Quan. And again, there's a little tiny bit of transition, but rather than being visual, as Katie's introduction was, or as uh, Cleo's introduction was, it is in the dialogue, in the narration, much where uh, as we got other context for uh, Katie in that same way, because it's Katie's father who mentions it, you know, is Wade going to be there? And, uh, and Katie said yes, that she Wade was going to be there. And when Katie goes to leave, she's like, you asked if Wade was going to be there because the, the intimation is that Wade is somebody that adults trust, right? And if Wade's going to be there, they're a little less worried. And Katie even says, you, you only said I could go, you know, in the middle of the night, basically, because Wade's going to be there. Uh, and Katie's father said, hey, if you kids get in trouble, I feel better knowing Wade Kwan's going to be there to help you get out of it. So when we, when we meet Wade and Will, they're twins. Wade is female. Will is male. I love the scene that we get. I love the perspective that we get when we see Wade for the first time. <clears throat> it's Wade leaning down over Will, trying to wake him up at 3.30 in the morning to go meet their friends. Again, it's, it's a quiet household. So there was light in Cleo's household. Lights were on, even though father and mother were asleep. Cleo was sort of a, an isolated ghost sort of going around in the house by herself, no dialogue. Here we get dialogue between Wade Kwan and Will Kwan, but it's quiet. The house is blue. The house is green in terms of lighting. So it's not brightly lit like Katie's house with sort of a brightness of Katie's personality. It's not lit, but feeling stark and isolated like Cleo's house. No, this is this is a quiet house. It's in the dark. It's a little harder for them to sneak out. We do learn that they live with their uh, uncle and their grandmother. And there's a, a little bit of banter back and forth between these two twins. Anybody who has siblings, who grew up with siblings close in age to them, this will feel familiar. And especially when it's twins who are the same age, right? Um, telling them, hey, Will, you got to get the F up. Time to go. Um, and again, we get a glimpse of the sleeping grandmother, and uh, there's a little bit of, um, again, a little bit of back and forth, a little bit of context, and yeah, I, they're running a little bit late because Will didn't want to get out of bed, uh, and then they both uh, agree that, well, it doesn't matter how late they are because in what world would they be later than Lux, and that's the transition where we're going to be introduced to, to Lux, which is the next character, but uh, thoughts on the Quan twins, Rocky? Uh, yeah, I had no idea they were twins. Uh, they, they're even different heights. Uh, they, they don't look to be the same height. I never got that impression at all, actually, but it, it makes sense because that, that explains why, that explains why Wade dyes, dyed her hair blue to make herself look different from her twin. But I never got that. I thought they were, I thought they maybe were. They're not, I, maybe they're not twins. I could have sworn I read I, that somewhere. Yeah, I, well, nowhere is it indicated that they're twins, but nothing is Nothing is inconsistent with them being twins, I guess. I mean, uh, but I, I just thought the way the panel was, and the, there's that one panel where they look to be different heights, different different heights, and so I thought they were just maybe either friends or or siblings. It wasn't really important, uh, but 
Uh, either way, it doesn't matter because you get to know these. You get to know these two, and you know they're either siblings or friends. And what again, an emphasis that while we have dialogue here, what it's it's what we learn about Will, or p- pardon me, what you uh, pardon me, yes, what you learn about Will. The, is that if you look at what the poster's on his wall, you know that he's a skateboarder and you know that he likes surfing. Those are the posters on his wall as he's, you know, he's slowly getting out of bed. And you know at some point they're going to be in water. And he, So you got to wonder what his... So I'm guessing his skill set is skateboarding. He's got a skateboard against the bed. He's got, he's got various posters there. It's just interesting. And he's got a great sense of humor. And, uh, and what's even more... What's what stands out as well, which I thought was really kind of almost kind of odd is that Katie's father is very, is very satisfied that, that, uh, that when Katie goes out, that Wade's going to be there. And that's the, that's, she's the, I guess the twin with with the glasses uh, that she, that she's so smart that apparently she's, she must be quite capable, (laughs) which, which is interesting because I would have thought that if the, you know, to me, the the guy that, to me, Wade or Will looks the most, you know, Will's the only guy in this entire group because they're all women. And I find Will, Will's kind of interesting. He's got long hair. He's almost like this, or almost like this Japanese Conan the Barbarian almost, but without the muscles. But <laughs> I don't know, it's just, it's just interesting. So just a, just a wonder, wonderfully eclectic group of people. And I think that's where when Kelly Thompson talks about this is sort of like a Goonie squad, they're they're much more cool than the Goonies, to be quite blunt. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's 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 very good. And I love these two page. You know, we get these two page spreads really, uh, with you know four panels each, getting to know these characters, and we learn so much about them before. Uh, as and by the end of the first issue, it's like, man, I I wanted to re- I wanted to get to the second, but no, it's it's like I said, big big smile on my face, impressive stuff. Yeah, they're definitely twins. Uh, Wade, as you mentioned, probably super intelligent, more intelligent of the two. Probably, you know, I know it's a cliche, but indicated by glasses. Um, Will being the more athletic, and even when he gets up out of bed and gets dressed, you can see behind him. Uh, again, you got to pay attention. There's there's medals hanging from the wall, like you know, medals that you would win in an athletic competition, as well as a trophy behind him that you see, as well as a surfboard in addition to the. Um, skateboard you can also see some trophies um when he sits up in bed you see some trophies on the shelf there so clearly this guy is very athletic um to the point where he's won numerous awards uh yeah definitely twins uh and maybe that's where i got it so i <laughs> either you didn't read my article rocket you didn't pay close enough attention because I, when I, did, we, I, did, I did not read your article no i did not how dare you uh <laughs> but anyway in the character descriptions that are in that article yes wade kwan wade is a jack of all trades and has mastered a few too Twin sister to Will, six minutes older. She's the older of the two. She's incredibly bright, but more, uh, but mostly more reserved than her friends. If she hadn't found them, it feels like she's the kind of person who would have been a loner. And it's definitely something she worries about a lot. Her favorite color is black. Her favorite food is cheeseburgers. And her favorite uh, movie is Mad Max Fury Road. As far as Will, uh, perhaps because he has surrounded himself with interesting, clever girls and his sister and their friends, Will Kwan is the most elusive, eligible bachelor in town, though he's mostly unaware of it. Grounded and kind, athletic and sharp-minded, Will is the best of them all, but he'd never agree to that, part of why he's the best. Uh, so not surprised you gravitated to Will right away. Uh, you're maybe a little male bias there. Uh, but what's interesting... Okay. What comes across to me for Will, you know, it mentioned here that he's grounded, kind, athletic, sharp-minded. So that comes across like he's he's intelligent. He can, uh, you know, grasp concepts or what have you. But th- there's almost like a naivete to him a little bit. You know, I wouldn't go. There's such a, a you know cliche of oh, if you're a jock, you're dumb, you're a meathead, what have you. We know he's sharp-minded. We're told uh, by Kelly Thompson that he's sharp-minded. Clearly, if he's uh, Friends, he's in this friends group with these other uh, girls who are all come across as very intelligent. Um, he's going to have to be as well. Uh, but again, there's a there's a sense to him that, um, again, a little innocent, a little naive. Probably because he's so high, kind uh, hearted, and probably is one of those people that just sort of inherently does the right thing all the time. 
that he assumes other people have that say, you know, he never assumes bad intentions from others. Uh, and I, you know, I, I know people that are like that and it can get you in trouble, right? Because you don't see the, sometimes the bad things coming, or you don't see that people are trying to take advantage of you because you can't fathom doing that yourself. And so you, you sort of miss it. You, you can't relate to their behavior. So, uh, so super interesting. Uh, last character we're introduced to Lux redhead, she's putting on her makeup in the mirror. That's what we, the first image we see of her she's covering a black eye she's covering up a black eye with makeup and she's looking into this mirror uh, that has lights going around it you can tell she's troubled by the look on her face and then she smiles uh and it's putting on that brave face better she says uh again brightly lit, lit house she creaks open her door she peeks out in the living room we see what i assume to be her mother pass out on the couch Again, there's a lot of context here. Beer cans strewn everywhere. Empty pizza box there. Uh, clearly, her mother has been partaking, we'll say, and has, hasn't fallen asleep so much as passed out. Uh, and you can tell by the lighting and the way the shadows lay that she's fallen asleep in front of a flickering TV. Um, and then we get a little ping from Lux's phone. She knows she's late. She, instead of going out the front door, she doesn't wake up her mom. She sneaks out the window. Uh, so that's our introduction to Lux. Now, one of the things I want to point out, clearly something going on with, you know, physical abuse or what have you with the black eye she's trying to cover up the, her look on her face, how worried and sad she is, but looks put together, right? Big hoop earrings, perfect makeup, and not just a little makeup, but, you know, full on mascara, eyeliner, you know, blush, the whole nine yards looks very put together. And then when she smiles and she says better, right? The way Mattia chose to depict Lux, right, in this mirror, and not just a mirror like just a mirror hanging on the wall, but a mirror that's framed, right? So I take that to be, here's the mirror. He, the eyes are the windows to the soul, we're, we're told, right? Lux is looking into the mirror. She's looking into her own eyes. She doesn't like what she sees, but then she puts on this fake little smile, and that's better, right? So when she looks into the mirror, this little snapshot, this framed mirror, she's looking at that mirror and thinking to herself, this is the perception. This is how the world sees me. How are they going to see me? I need them to see me the way I want them to see me in this narrow little window of the world and what I'm presenting to the world. Not because I feel I deserve to be seen that way or think I should be seen that way, but because I have bad things going on in my life and I can't let people know. I've got to put on the brave face. I've got to put on the fake smile. I've got to make sure I control the way people see me, the narrative that they're getting, I don't want to appear weak, right? Like that's something that uh, people that have to deal with abuse, that's their coping mechanism, right? You, you're ashamed, you're humiliated, you're worried on some level, you deserve the abuse you're getting, um, you feel less, you don't feel worthy, there's embarrassment and, and all those negative feelings. And so it's all about putting on the brave face. You're very concerned with how does the world perceive me? Right. What is that snapshot they see of me? And so that's Lux. That's how we're introduced to her. That's what came across for me. Uh, what about you, Rocky? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, again, just like uh, I didn't know, just like I didn't know the, I didn't know Wade and Willis Will were twins until you told me. Uh, but again, it's it's not that important here. I I didn't know. I knew she. I figured she was abused. I figured she probably had. I wasn't sure if that was her girlfriend who had abused her, who was sleeping on the couch. <laughs> or her mother. I think it ends up being her mother. But it was clear, like you said, I mean, you nailed it. I mean, clearly uh, a woman who's covering up a black eye with makeup, you know, she's in an abusive relationship or somehow got that black eye. And, and, and as it's subsequently revealed, it's, it's, it's her mother's in an abusive relationship and uh, the, the mother had kicked the boyfriend out, which is subsequently revealed later on. But again, it's the, it's the fact that right away you, you got, it's just, it's amazing how it, it speaks to friendship because all these characters that we're meeting, they're friends <laughs> and they, they're they friends and they love each other and they hang out together and they got such different lives. And yet, isn't that something about friendship? You know, very, very different people can be, can become very good friends. And that's exactly what this, what makes this story uh, so in so interesting. This is only the first issue. I'm not sure where this where this series is going, but I'm I care about these characters 
despite their their vast differences. And I'm really curious to see where where it goes. And like you said, you can and the way you the way you describe the mirror there and everything. It's funny how you can get different things from different images. You can, I, I love that you can look at a, a, a picture and see different things. Different readers can, can see different things. And because we all bring our different experiences to the table when we look at these types of characters, that maybe we can relate to certain aspects in our own life. And we see things that maybe other readers don't. That's the power of this, of this imagery is that each reader can read the nuance into different degrees themselves and that's the power of this narrative and again i, I can't emphasize enough just how uh sounding like a broken record how how impressed i am because you know i read kelly thompson's captain marvel i've read her jessica jones and i've uh you know we we, we reviewed some Har harley quinn story of hers but this is by far the best work that i've ever read of hers not that i've read all of it but this is this is really this is by far, you know. Honestly, I wouldn't have thought she'd wrote, wrote this. <laughs> I mean that in the highest complimentary way. But impressive stuff. Yeah. Last description here of Lux uh, of Lux Bell, as Wade says, never count out Lux. Though Lux is in some ways, uh, though Lux in some ways appears like the odd man out of her fairly exceptional friends, the truth is Lux can do anything she sets her mind to which maybe helps explain why she made friends with some of the best and brightest, knowing it would push her to be better too. Her favorite color is gold. Her favorite food is tacos. Her favorite movie, Lost in Translation, is what she tells people's her favorite movie, but really it's Step Brothers. Again, absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Just in that little description, we know so much about her, right? It's exactly what I was saying. She appears to be the odd man out. She doesn't appear to be exceptional. But the thing is, she can do anything she sets her mind to, and that speaks to being a survivor, being somebody who's lived through abuse, you, you gain a strength of, uh, of character, uh, a strength of personality to endure and to, to stick to things and to get through things and to have goals and to just see them through. Um, and again, putting on that face, right? How does the world perceive me? I, if somebody asks me what my favorite movie is, I'm going to say Lost in Translation because it's... Um, cerebral and it says something about me and I must be smart and intelligent for that to be my favorite movie, whatever. But really, if you peel everything back and take away the brave face she's trying to show the world, her favorite movie really is Step Brothers because that's a movie you can watch and you can laugh and you don't have to think about it and you don't have to be kind of in, in your own way, in your own head, right? And somebody who, like Lux, who's constantly worried about the shame and embarrassment that might come her way if people were to find out she was abused because, hey, if I'm abused... Either I must deserve it or I'm weak and I can't protect myself. Um, so let me put on this brave face. Let me make people think I'm smarter than I am or, or what have you. And just the fact, like, why, why why, even make up what your favorite movie is? Just somebody asks you what your favorite movie is, just tell, tell them, right? But that's not something, everything Lux does has purpose, right? There's another purpose behind. Uh, so that's the introduction to all the characters. Uh, I have to say for my money, my favorite right away, the one that I connected with the, the best. Can you guess, Rocky? Who do you think is is my favorite? I'm gonna guess your favorite is Will, because uh, he's the oh. guy. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, the the one that I was the most intrigued with uh, was actually Cleo because because I, I felt I, I felt her emotion because she's because it's ultimately revealed she she ultimately is looking for her brother. So that that's like truly it was Cleo was the one that she's the most broken I think out of all of them. And, um, uh, but I, I like, I like Will, I do, because I, I do think uh, I've always been on this kick. I think having a, a good, strong male character in any group setting is, you know, if you're going to have a bunch of women in a story, I think it always had cool. It's good to have a, a strong male character as well, like a, a, a good, strong male presence. And that's what, uh, that's what Will is, which is, uh, which is good. But Cleo is the one that's the most interesting and it shouldn't surprise it. Well, she's she's right on the cover too, Cleo. I mean, she's uh, she's by far. I, I she's the the centerpiece of the story, at least I think, uh, as the story continues. But uh, as far as go ahead, I was gonna say I definitely feel more like an ensemble piece now. Cleo, I think Cleo will merge as kind of the leader because yeah, ulterior motives in this, and probably her thought all along, right, yeah. to go exploring and have her friends along very exploitive, very selfish, 
because uh, she wants to rescue her brother and she's not thinking in those terms. Um, so I get, yeah, I, I get, I get that. And she may be the, the character that drives the story forward the most, but there also could be an argument for saying Katie's more of a quiet leader because she's not, she's not, she's a more of a natural leader, right? Like people are going to follow her be, just because of who she is. Not Is that your she, choice, Katie? Is that your choice? No, that's not my choice. Oh. But I, I'm just, I, I find that dynamic to be interesting because, yeah, it does seem like with what we learn a little bit later that Cleo wants to be a leader. Again, she's pulling everybody along. She wants to be able to use their skills selfishly to hopefully find and rescue her brother if he needs rescuing, but at least find him. Um, and so she she's going to lead and she's going to do it whether they follow her or not. As opposed to Katie, she's a more natural leader. I think people sort of gravitate toward her and open up to her a little more um, just because of who she is, the way she is, you know, in the description, it's she mentioned as an it girl. So people follow her just because she makes good choices. She makes smart choices and she's intelligent, but no, my favorite is Lux. My favorite is Lux. And, you know, not that I was in an abusive relationship or was abused as a child or what have you, but there's a lot of, Hey, how the constant worry of how I present myself to the world. I was very insecure when I was um, younger very very shy where that that's where that came from and so i was constantly worried about what people thought of me or um you know how i was perceived or or what have you because i was just so painfully shy and socially awkward and so i know anybody who's met me in person and had especially had drinks with me be like what (laughs) shocked by that but yeah so she's she's the one that is so interesting to me because there's such a dichotomous uh dichotomous aspect to the character right we're told she can do anything she can put her mind to. There's a strength to her. Wade, who the the one adult that we get that talks in the first issue, trusts Wade more than anybody, right? Katie's father trusts Wade Kwan more than anybody. Feels that his daughter will be okay if Wade Kwan is there. And Wade's the one that says, when Lux is late, never count out Lux. So here is, you know, the, the supposed best and brightest of them, best and brightest of the best and brightest, who's throwing support behind Lux. So yeah, there's, I'm intrigued by Lux. Not to say the other, you know, characters aren't interesting or whatever, but there's something about Lux that really resonated with me. So yeah, she's, she's my favorite. Uh, so yeah, the, the rest of them are waiting there outside, worried because Lux is late. Like I texted her and then, Hey, there she is. And Cleo's good. Just that one word. Good. Like terse, like there she is. Hurry up. Let's go. We've been waiting. Um, you know, never, never count Lux out and the girl could wriggle free of the apocalypse if she set her mind to it and they want to get moving. Um, and then again, Wade being sort of the voice of reason, Hey, you know, the tide's not really that low. Maybe we should reschedule whatever. And Cleo, nobody's canceling anything. We're doing this. And other, uh, members of the group sort of, um, bringing up reasons why they shouldn't be doing this. Hey, it's dark. The sun isn't up for two hours. How are we going to shoot film? Hey, we're you know bringing bringing this up now. Lux is like, I've been bringing this up. Nobody responded. Um, and then the the scene as they're walking out toward the rock, they're walking through the water in the low tide. The the look on Lux's face. She's saying, oh, I should have brought different shoes. It's just masterful storytelling. You can tell she doesn't want to be getting wet somebody who's concerned about their looks and doesn't want to be walking through water, what have you. We see some, I won't go so far as to say animosity, but there's tension between Katie and Cleo. We know that, you know, there's strain in their relationship right now. Uh, And then we've got the twins walking, you know, right next to each other as twins often will um, because they're just inherently close. So again, fantastic storytelling really interesting with the backdrop of the water and the mist and the stark black rock as they, uh, as they climb up on shore. Um, so you got to pay attention. A lot of context and storytelling in not exactly what they're saying, but in the way they're saying it and in their interactions with each other. So uh, yeah, they're going on an adventure and uh, their kids out in the middle of the night. So well, yeah, I was, I was a little bit, uh, I was a little bit curious because I, I know they, they, they were in their conversation. It, it's mentioned. One of them mentions that it, they, they've got thirteen or about twelve or thirteen hours uh, for the before the tide comes back in, and so they're sort of on a time limit. So they want to go into this, 
into this into this rock mountain and and into this cave and to, and to they've got 12 hours to to film what they need to film it's still not clear even by the end what exactly the group was going in to film even though we it is revealed that Cleo had an ulterior motive to basically look i guess look for her brother Jake uh for uh because she has some suspicion as to what this rock mountain really is i was curious as to what um, it was never clear to me exactly what they were going to go out and actually film, but that's really not important at all because, and that's that's kind of like, I like that misdirection because I'm I'm thinking in my mind, okay, well, why exactly are they going out in the middle of the night? Because one of them, I think it was Lux asked, or part of me, it was Katie asked or texted uh, Cleo, you know, why do do why do we have to do this at three thirty in the morning again? If the tide lasts for twelve hours, can't we just go at eight or nine when there's daylight and you know, and uh, but by the end, you realize that it really doesn't matter what the hell they were there filming because there's a far bigger cliffhanger here <laughs> involving another world, another place that completely captivates your attention. And so you get you get all that all in one shot. You get these you get you, you meet every single character. You feel like you know them uh, at, at halfway through the comic. And then all of a sudden you're in this you're in this incredible setting. Uh, you're in this rock. You're in this rock cave. You're, they're having conversations with each other. You learn more about their relationships with each other. Uh, you fill in the blanks of some of the blanks that you didn't fill in through the amazing art through the first half of the comic, and then at the end you get this amazing otherworldly atmosphere, and boom, it ends. And what a way to end a comic! And this thing is only this thing's only twenty three pages long. Uh, I think I got I count twenty three pages in our, in there in some, these these uh, preview copies and wow I'm like I said I'm just um, I'm I'm really impressed I'm really impressed with this and I uh, very jealous I uh, your, of your Tula Latte cover but I think I'm gonna have a hard time getting a hold of that one I'll have to spend too much money on eBay but uh, yeah so were you uh, let me ask you this Jace how did you find the uh, did the well, I guess when you first read it, did you find, did the ending catch you off? Were you, were you surprised by, by the cliffhanger? No, I, I sort of expected it. Um, yeah, I sort of expected the rock to be some sort of portal or to be a uh, key to the mystery um, of not necessarily Jake's disappearance. But, you know, again, we saw Kaiju in the, uh, in the preview images. So I, I thought it would be some sort of portal or there's something there that would unlock the kind of the mystery that, that you have. And you're right. We're not told necessarily what they were going out there to film. We're, it's mentioned casually. Hey, when Lux is complaining, Hey, we're going to, this is going to make you a star Lux. And she's like, ah, the phrase, you know, is it worth it comes to mind. She says she's having to walk through the water, ruining her shoes to get out there. And also earlier when Katie was talking to her dad, she mentioned the director's being slave to the light, right? Again, to explain why they're out there, they got to catch that early morning light. But again, Cleo, uh, ulterior motives didn't have any uh, any intention, I think, of going out there and ma making any sort of short film. She wanted to go out there and explore because she thinks The Rock has something to do with her, uh, the disappearance of her uh, of her brother. Um, but as they reach The Rock, uh, Lux does fall in, in the water and Katie sort of catches her. But the water splashes up on her face and it washes off some of that makeup. And as Lux starts to walk to sort of catch up to the rest of the group, Katie pulls her aside and says, hey, hold on a second, and flashes her, uh, puts her flashlight in her face, sees the black guy, says, are you all right? It's what Rocky alluded to earlier, um, that we're told that, uh, yeah, it was her uh, mother's boyfriend that did this, and uh, she said, he, he, you know, he hit her, and then when I got involved, he hit me, and it sucked, but now he's gone. My mom, you know, she threw him out hard. He won't be back. Uh, and then Katie hears the butt in her voice and says, but well, then she got blackout drunk and passed out. She still passed out when I left, but she'll pull herself together. She always does. Um, and again, that speaks to who Lux is and who her mother is, right? Like a lot of those things that I said about Lux in terms of the shame and the embarrassment, uh, being in an abusive relationship or what have you, those apply to her mother too. Like so often, unfortunately, that sort of abuse is generational, right? Like you see your mother in an abusive relationship and for whatever reason, that's the behavior you model. And then you yourself go get in an abusive relationship uh, and it just becomes this cycle. So, you know, we I mentioned the other um, 
friends believing in Lux and believing that she can do anything she can set her mind to, well, that's the strengths of her mother as well, right? She pulls herself together. She always does. And uh, this interaction between Katie and Lux, and, and you know, it, it does also show that Lux cares about uh, Katie as much as Katie hears about Lux, and we'll get to that in a second. But it also really illustrates what I said earlier about that quiet leadership quality that Katie has, right? She's like, hey, I told you if that asshole ever laid hands on you, you know, it's because Katie's going to be that person that does the right thing inherently she's going to go and you know even if the guy is three times her size she's going to go and confront him and stand up for her friend because that's just who she is inherently so this is my probably my favorite scene in the entire book this exchange between katie and lux because it gives so much context into these two characters and it's just masterful storytelling and gorgeous art um and you look, look at the facial expressions right the look on Lux's face when she's discovered, if you will, right? When the makeup's washed off, her black eyes there. The concern on Katie's face and the beginning of anger, right? When she says, I told you if that asshole ever laid hands. And then the downcast eyes of Lux after she says, yeah, she threw him out. He won't be back. And, you know, she looks down because, again, it's it's not just embarrassment and shame for herself and this situation she's in, but also for her mother, that her mother showed weakness by getting blackout drunk after Yes, there's um, a strength to Lux that probably comes from her mother, right? Like I was just talking about being able to survive abuse and get through it, but also weakness, right? In Lux's eyes, her mother is showing weakness by the fact she had to deal with this situation, this blow up, this fight, whatever you want to call it, by escaping through alcohol, right? Not the healthy way to, uh, to deal with it. So... Uh, again, masterful storytelling, absolutely gorgeous. And then the following page, it's Lux's turn uh, as Cleo sticks her head around the rocks. Hey, you guys coming? And Lux says, hey, are you sure it's even me we should be talking about? And Katie, you could see the look on her face. The uh, She doesn't want to talk about this, right? Now she's feeling uncomfortable. She's like, wait, Cleo? Cleo and me being a mess is old news. And Lux saying, yeah, but you guys are, were so good together. Uh, I thought you were going to do a big romantic gesture remind Cleo that she's still alive. She's still loved because again, we know the trauma Cleo's uh, dealing with is the fact that her brother's missing, right? She can't focus. She can't think about romantic love. She can't think about relationship. All she can think about is her brother. Um, and Katie obviously had this idea to do some big romantic gesture to remind Katie that you're not the one that's missing. You're not the one that's possibly dead. You're loved and you're still alive and you're still here and I'm here for you. And again, it shows that Lux is not so wrapped up just in herself she does have um, feelings and worries about her friends and and uh, and what have you. And so, uh, again, fantastic characterization. And it flows and it comes across so well and it feels natural, right? This feels like natural dialogue for young people at this age, formative years, dealing with trauma, growing up and, you know, just dealing with life. It's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. And as they enter the cave, um, again really great artwork as the story starts to shift gets a little bit away from the emotionality and characterization and goes a little more into the mystery and this is a a scene that um kelly thompson showed in preview images a lot as these um, five young kids are shining their light into the cave um, again great light work by matea and they're all looking in with various states of wonder wonder what's in there mystery apprehension just really really good um artwork uh, for sure so uh what do you think about the exchange between uh the back and forth between katie and lux anything to add uh no not really i mean you pretty much you covered all of it pretty thoroughly i mean it was it was it, it just added so much substance and context to it and if you if you didn't pick up on the very subtle uh visual cues that Katie and uh, Katie and Cleo were in a relationship. It was obviously it was basically all the quiet parts were said out loud. And it, and one of the things that it was funny that that, that impressed me so much is uh, I'm reminded of a, a Flash comic that you and I reviewed where we you, you got to uh, Jeremy Adams was playing a game with where where Doctor Fate they were sort of trapped and you had to find clues in the comic books. Well, yeah. here I was looking for the red flags. Because the red flags with the sad faces on it that, that Cleo was packing in order to, 
to plant along the way so they they'd be able to backtrack and wouldn't get lost. That they they never once say in the comic that's what what the hell those flags are for. But you there's there's three panels where you see the flag behind the characters. And and they're they're planting them along the way, but you don't actually see them plant them. You just they're in the they're in the picture. The flags are there in the cave. And so it, it's just a, a a beautiful effect that you know, you know, the Again, Kelly Thompson is not spoon feeding the reader. She's assuming that you're going to take the time to actually look at the beautiful pictures, the gorgeous art, and the art fills in the blanks where the dialogue doesn't. This is a, a such a this is this is a perfect example of what happens when you get a great writer and a great artist and they collaborate well together because sometimes great writers don't collaborate well with great artists. <laughs> but this, uh, but this is, they, they were clearly on the same page here and uh, it's just extremely impressive stuff. And yeah, and leading into, of course, they finally get uh, looking into that, looking into this, looking through the light at the end of that tunnel, so to speak, which is symbolic in so many ways. And I guess, I guess that's, that's where we're at. We, that's, we get to the end of the story that to the final, the final few pages where they, they come across this, this bright light. You know, you you think that they're going to go somewhere to maybe do some filming, but instead they see a bright light and they peer through this light at the end of the tunnel and boom, you get this gorgeous double page spread, which I'm assuming must have been on Kelly uh, Thompson's Substack or at some point too as well. Did she ever tease that image? Uh, yeah, I think I think we got that at some point. Um, but <laughs> one thing that's interesting and, and uh, speaks to what you were saying about from the very beginning when you were kind of talking about the book, how this is instigated by Cleo. This was her intent all along. When Katie says, hey, is that light up ahead? Or that can be possible. Sun can't be coming up yet as Wade's looking at her watch to see what time it is. And Cleo not hesitating, right? Doesn't even respond. Just keeps heading toward the light. Um, and then, you know, holy crap. Oh, my God. They're on, you know, another world. Everybody's looking to Cleo for answers. Because I think they sense it too, just like we as the reader sense it, they sense it as well. Like, hey, are you seeing this? What's going on? Uh, and I think Cleo, in a way, she had her suspicions. Uh, she even said, "I knew there was something here. I found it before, but I didn't. I uh, didn't come through. Was it a dream? Was it when she was super young and didn't really remember it? Like we don't know. But she had she had suspicions, right? She must have had suspicions. She thinks this is where Jake is, where her brother is." And she wants everybody's help, but if they're to find him, but if they're not willing to help, she'll do it on her own. But she had her suspicions, and this is why she sort of, you know, it's a terrible word to use, but manipulated her friends into going there for exactly this reason. It's why she brought the flags. It's part of who she is, and like I said, in in the way that she's a leader. Everybody else sensing it and going, Cleo, what's going on? And she doesn't want to answer because I think she's overwhelmed. You know, there's a sense of, oh my God, I was right. There is something here. Could this be where Jake is? Am I going to be able to find them? And she's kind of lost in her, in, in the moment of, I was right. What comes next? How can I figure this out? And they all finally all have to shout together, Cleo, you know, what is this? And that's when she mentions, you know, I don't know, but I, I knew there was something here before. Um, and for Wade, she says her brain feels like it's breaking. This is for somebody like her who's so intelligent uh, and probably very literal and scientific and, you know, believes in things that are concrete and can be proven and what have you to be confronted with something like this. That's going to shake their, their belief system a little bit. Right. Yeah. So and, that's, uh, that's, and what I, I love the final, the final panel is where as she, you know, the final two panels, the second last panel, She's Cleo's got tears streaming down one one tear streaming down each eye, and then she she you know she you know Katie uh, Katie says to her you think Jakey's in there don't you and she says yes and I'm going to find him and and that final panel when she's walking into the light and you see that flag that's planted with the sad face on it and it just sets the mood and the tone and and sort of like the the, the tragedy yet the anticipation of what's going to come next and just. You know, I mean, talk about talk about me just pulling me into the next issue, and I, I want. I'm really looking forward to this series, and I. It's so easy to imagine this lasting more than five issues. I can't believe that this is going to be ending in one in just five issues. So I'm, 
I'm so curious. I'm just, uh, I'm so glad you uh, recommended this because I, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have put this on my pull list had you not mentioned it. So it's good stuff. Yeah. And I love Wade in that last panel is, or not Wade rather, but Will in that last panel as he's sort of uh, sitting down on the rock, head in hands, knowing that this is probably not going to turn out well, but also knowing that he's, you know, that kind of that faithful sidekick, he's going to, he's going to go along uh, with his friends. And this, the way it ends, uh, provide so much context to that flash forward we got at the beginning. I, I still sort of feel like it wasn't necessary. I mean, I totally get it for people who maybe don't read comics as carefully as us. Um, they might have needed that hook to provide a little momentum for them to keep going. Uh, but for me, with the character work, that that was enough for me to be compelling. It could have gone from that scene with the rock and mentioning the, the black rock uh and, and skip the flash forward and, and just gone to this. And I still would have been just as interested and just as uh, hooked and felt just as compelled to keep reading, but I get it. It's the, you know, that idea of it does provide more context and more consequences and more stakes because we know these young people are going to go in to wherever this world is, this alternate reality, alternate dimension, whatever. Um, and what's going to follow them back or what they unleash is that's where the terror comes from. That's where the horror comes from, right? With people being eaten on the beach and only their shoes left behind. So uh, the, the only thing, the only thing for me, the only nitpick, the only negative I have about this comic, um, because again, huge chunk of storytelling, a lot of it in the uh, visuals rather than narrative. The only thing, the negative I can say is I want the rest of the story immediately. <laughs> like I, I did not want it to end when it ended because other other than that this is a perfect comic this is a 10 out of 10 um it's it's uh, yeah amazing and uh, that's why i tried to spread the word is why i tried to tell everybody it's why i wrote the article it's why i was talking about it on the podcast um so yeah i hope you guys all picked it up if you did miss it and can't find a copy um and you don't really care about you know speculator value or what have you yes yeah, when the second issue hits stands uh as i mentioned earlier the uh, the f second printing of the first issue will be in comic shops as well, um, and I'll I'll get that date for you right now because Kelly mentioned the date in her uh, Substack. So that's going to be uh, September thirteenth. September thirteenth, issue two hits comic shops, and uh, second printing for issue one. So lesson learned, right? If you missed out, tell your retailer now. <laughs> Hey, I need issue two. I need issue three. I need issue four. I need issue five. Tell them now. Um, I got to think this is going to be one of those situations. It doesn't happen often, uh, but this is going to be one of those situations where numbers are going to go up, right? Sales numbers are going to go up uh, after the first issue, uh, which is great. So that means word of mouth is working. Things are selling out. People are paying attention. Unfortunately, it means especially those ratio covers for the first issue. Probably going to have some short-term value. Whether this has long long-term value or not remains to be seen. I, I I can't really think, and maybe you know, I know you speculate a lot, Rocky. Maybe you can recall. I can't really recall a a five-issue series where the value was maintained. Um, you know, when I think about series, independent comics where the value is maintained, it's things that are a little more long-form, uh, especially in other media. So, I mean, the two that immediately come to mind when you talk about long-term value, uh, well, there's three, really. Uh, Saga, well, Walking Dead is probably the first one, right? Well, that, something Dead. is killing the children. It yeah, continues. that would be the third. Yeah, yeah, that would be the third, which has not shown up in other media yet. Neither has Saga. Yeah. Uh, but something is kill killing the children is being worked on for other media. And uh, I think Saga is as well. Something that's killing the children is a little more a little further along, I think a little more concrete. Um, but yeah, walking dead obviously is, is the other. So I, I don't know. I, I sort of have the feeling that I don't think these issues will, I think they're going to hit their peak. I think ratio cost or what have you ratio amounts for these first issues are probably going to be at the highest they ever are sort of right around this time. Um, or if it does get some sort of film, uh, later on that's well received that could possibly um, but if you want one of the racial variants I think just be patient they'll the prices on those will come back down once the series is all said and done now 
that's what the caveat of this not continuing because I, as I said, Kelly, I think, and Mattia both have mentioned they would like, they have a lot more story to tell if this is successful. Uh, and if that's the case and it ends up going longer, um, like a saga or ex machina, something like that, uh, it, and those are both by Brian K. Vaughn. Uh, but yeah, it, it could end up being worth, uh, have a long term value uh, more than uh, I think it really will. I mean, I didn't necessarily buy these on spec. I bought it because I read it and I loved it and the covers are all awesome. And it was actually cheaper to get a set of all the covers than to just buy the one in 50, which is why I ended up with the set. So wow. yeah, uh, I loved it. It blew me away. I was super impressed. That's why I was banging the drum. So I hope you guys all listened. Yeah, for sure. No, high rec high recommend. And, and, and it was a nice, it was a nice distraction from all the DC we read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are so many great books coming out right now. Uh, I mean, this, No One, World Tree, uh, Radiant Black. I mean, yeah. uh, Public Domain. Yeah. Just, yeah, there are some really, really, really great. I mean, DC's putting out some decent books too. So is Marvel. Um, but man, the books that get me most excited these days, uh, yeah, it's independent stuff. So, okay. all right. Uh, anything else to add, Rocky? No, I think we pretty much covered it. No, it's, again, just high recommend. Yep, high recommend. Hope you guys all go pick it up. I mean, I know we broke it down in, in detail here, but something to be said for reading it yourself. Uh, maybe you're going to get stuff out of it that I missed. Maybe you're going to bring your own life experiences and it's going to be a different reading experience for you. So we gave you the the you know big broad strokes of the story here. But that being said, if you're like, ah, I really want to know what the call is about, but I don't want to spend the money. So I'm just going to watch a video. I still recommend go check it out. And the other thing is watching it on a little screen and seeing this art digitally is no substitute for looking at the, having it in your hands and looking at it yourself. So high, high, high recommend 10 out of 10, go check it out. Uh, and also if you're checking us out on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to Rocky's channel, comic space, boom, exclamation point. Let us know if you read the call, what you got out of it, what, what things you learned from this video that you didn't catch uh, the first time through, what things that we still may have missed. Uh, yeah, just leave comments below. Be sure you like and subscribe. Ring the notification bell so you know when new videos come out. And if you've stumbled across this on YouTube and you're curious about the other uh, content, the audio-only content that comes out from the comic source, you can go back and listen to previous interviews I've done with Kelly Thompson. She's been on the few show a few times. She'll be on again in the future. I didn't want to have her on kind of around this time because she's doing a lot of interviews right now. I'd rather wait and have her on later um, when she's not doing so many of them. Uh, but there are those interviews with her and interviews with a ton of other creators as well, more upcoming. Um, so be sure and check those out by going to wherever you get your podcast, do a search for the comic source and subscribe. So that's going to do it for this special episode talking about the cull, everybody. We appreciate you joining us and we'll talk to you next time. Catch you later. <laughs>